Hello, I'm Paul Wilkinson and I'm making a series of documentaries about Nepalese shamanism in the Himalayas and I'm introducing a whole load of ritual objects, shamanic objects and other ritual objects to give an idea about how they're used and how they change the way that we interact with the world. So today I want to show a few masks, some shamanic masks and some from other traditions and uh, give a little bit of an introduction about how they're used. This is a very unusual mask from the Taru people in the Terai. That's um, the edge of Nepal and over towards the Indian border. And it's made out of the branches of a tree. So this is from the Ramayana and you can see it, it would be worn so they would wrap a, a lot of fabric around the face first and um, this is uh, Ravana or, or Ruana who's the big uh, giant demon that um, abducted Sita and this is Sita and this is Hanuman who's come to rescue Sita so Hanuman flies through the sky searching for Sita and finds her and then talks to her and brings her something from Rama to show who he is and then he goes back again to Rama and then he, he learns that he can change shape and they set fire to him and he, he lights the whole of Sri Lanka sets it all on fire and eventually rescues her and returns her so we have a Hanuman who's the monkey god here and um, Sita in her form where she looks a little like Kali with the tongue out and uh, forearms showing her many different aspects and then the giant uh, Ravana or Rawana who's who's abducted her so this is this is a cultural mask um, and it would be played out a way of playing out the uh, the Ramayana which is in a massive Hindu epic so the Ramayana and the Mahabharata are the main Hindu epics that underpin most of Hinduism so you have a whole variety of festivals where you have the birthdays of the gods, you have particular aspects or scenes that happen within within the Ramayana and the, the Mahabharata. So and each of those also have a they have a much deeper level where all the characters, for instance, in the Mahabharata are also energy channels in the body and acupuncture points. So the characters are actually meridians and chakras and acupuncture points and the, the, they're personified, they're given a, a, a human characteristic or a god characteristic in order for us to understand the particular qualities. So you have these layers and layers of, uh, of, of energy and culture and science and mythology all layered into each other in, in Eastern culture. And this is something which is many, many thousands of years old. Um, until fairly recently they thought that these stories were about 5,000 years old but they've now found statues which are an additional 11,000 years old in the, the cities that are all around um, the edge of India and now under the sea so cities that were there are, are before the Ice Age so, and, and that includes things like um, statues of people in the low yoga position so before they thought that Patanjali, the, the founder of yoga, was, was only several thousand years old. They're now thinking another, another 11,000 or even further back. So incredibly ancient and sophisticated cultures. So this, this mask is also from the Tara people, but much more a tribal mask. It would be designed to have um, see little holes in the beak here. It's designed to have a, a, a string coming through and it would be danced so it's a peacock mask and they would clap this and then they do the, the, the dance where they're stamping the feet and wiggling the tail and opening the tail up. So it's often accompanied by um, other dancers and people in traditional costumes dancing on either side and with the men, men drumming. So that's a tribal cultural mask. Now 
this piece is something which is probably much more shamanic. I say probably because I've never seen this before. So um, I can read a lot of the symbolism within it. I know a little bit about where it's come from. But until I, until I confirm the things that I know, I can't definitely say what it is. So you have, it's from the, the Rai people, from an area near to Bhutan, so in far east Nepal. And you have a, a character here with the tongue out, so, but with a, a moustache. So it's a male character, possibly an aspect of Shiva. The tongue is, is about vitality, it's about, um, and it's also a sign of the energy flowing, so the tongue can be used as, a, as an energy switch when you bring energy up the back. So the tongue is out, a little bit like the yogic lion's roar where the tongue is extended, like, like this. And then you have a, a, what looks like a leopard at the top, and these healing herbs on the forehead and all over these nagas. So you have uh, two different snake gods wrapping all the way around. So the naga wrapping around and intertwined here, covered in flowers. So the naga are, uh, represent the snake gods that live inside the waterways and inside the earth and are symbols for healing, and for the energies inside the chakras and also for the vitality of the earth the growth and the freshness and the, the purity of the earth so you, you see we've got these two snakes wrapped around each other very very beautifully carved coming all the way up and then you've got these interesting designs here around the throat which I'm not sure what that symbolism is. Very interesting, I've not seen that before. And the same plant. So one of the things I'll try and do is identify what this plant is. And I need to find someone who's seen a mask like, like this before. But very beautiful, very interesting. You see where you can actually look through the sides here. And um, so it's a, obviously to be danced and performed. So this is a shaman mask from um, far west Nepal. It's from a, a, a very remote mountainous region and I have three metal masks like this. This one has been cast in several pieces so the headband is cast separately and then there was obviously a fault with the casting and they've made this patch and riveted it on in the process of making it. So, the thing that's really interesting about this mask is you've got three different levels. You've got the headband, which probably had feathers and things and porcupine quills stuck in here. So the headband represents the upper world. The eyes and cheeks and nose are the middle world, and the mouth and chin are the lower world. So. With the upper world, you have a temple in the middle, like a, a shamanic spirit house. And then you have horses either side of that with shaman on their backs. And the zigzag, which probably represents mountains in the, in the distance. And the horses are seen as the traditional vehicle for the shaman. So the drum and the horse are often interchangeable in the way they describe uh, the, the rhythm of the drum is the vehicle and so well, sometimes when they're going into trance they'll be drumming and they'll talk about their horse and they actually mean their drum. So you've got a very interesting thing of the shaman riding on the back of their horses towards the spirit house. So in the middle you have two deer with antlers and you have the eyes and the nose for the senses nose rings and other jewellery and then a, a naga on so a snake god underneath the deer and the earrings so the deer are often seen as uh, very spiritual animals and the shaman are, are often very connected with, with deer so I've often I've also experienced lots of um, very 
I've also experienced lots of very beautiful encounters with deer and stags where I've been in, in the forests in England and where the stags have come very close. Even as a child, I've had these wonderful, wonderful experiences where the stags came to within a few feet and we, we made eye contact and then all the deer came all around us and we stood together for a long time in the, in the forest. And so the stag also have a, they're super sensitive to the energy in the ground. So they've now found that when you do dousing, a lot of the standing stones are in the same, have the same energetic signature as um, the rutting grounds for the stags. So the stags are picking particular places um, with electromagnetic energy and then probably the ancient peoples, the ancient um, people from, from England and France and a lot of Northern Europe were, were using the same locations to, to make their sacred, sacred sites. So you've got the, the deer and the stag and then the naga, the snake got under it and then on the, down on the chin you have two more naga and a sort of a crab or something like that, so another water type being. So you've got the, the lower world and the mouth also to do with digestion and excretion and the eyes to do with awareness of the, the senses and then the third eye is the, the temple is, is up where the, the brow is. So uh, very, very interesting, beautiful mask from far, far west of all. So, in the same tradition, another shamanic mask. This one of a, a bull, possibly of a water buffalo, um, with a shaman figure standing between the horns. So you often have um, this symbol of, of the sun or a figure between, framed between the horns. So it's like the ascending power of the animal spirit. So this would be used as a sort of a guide. So again, very simple, very beautiful. Has been made with the lost wax technique. So they'll have used the wax, probably from wild honey, or from uh, the village honey, where they, in the sides of the houses they have um, beehives. So they, they take out a little, a few blocks of stone, they put like a wooden, uh, wooden panel in where they make holes and then they encourage the bees they move wild bees inside the house and then they have a panel inside the house that they can lay they cover it with mud and they can later remove that so they've made this out of wax first and then they form like a clay mold around that or sometimes a very very fine sand mold around it and then they burn out the wax when they pour the metal in and that's why it's called lost wax. So it's a one-off. Every every one of these is just a, a one-time creation. There would be, there's not another one of these like this in the world. So again, the shaman in the in the position of the ascending the ascending power, and another one also from the same area of a ram. So with the round eyes. The ears here, this is very old, so it's, the ears are broken off, but you see the horns. Very simple, very, very beautiful mask. So, this is, so one way to think about these is that the mask is like an image of the inside, of the inner face. So the shaman is using this as a way to bring out the inner qualities and to pour themselves into something more archetypal, more spiritual, more um, transcendent. And in the case of an animal, maybe to embody the quality of the, that, the spirit of that animal so that they can, um, they can go on a, on a shamanic journey or they can dance embodying the energy of the animal to discover a piece of information. So here's a couple of other masks. Now I'm not sure whether these are shamanic or whether they're from a tribal tradition. 
They're also Nepali. So this is a, a monkey. It's very be beautifully carved. So the monkeys are um, I nearly made the monkey sound. Then. So the monkeys are seen as um, spirits of ingenuity and cunning and cleverness. Um, sometimes a fierceness of mobility. Um, and you have these stories of the of Hanuman leading his monkey monkey army, and um, and Hanuman himself is a, an image of loyalty and good-heartedness, of of absolute loyalty and innocence. So he he's possessed of so many powers, but he doesn't even know his own strength or his own powers. So you always have this these um, this sense of not knowing, the sense of just doing the right thing from the purity of his heart. So, and then, so this is probably one of Hanuman's uh, generals in his army. It's not Hanuman because if it were Hanuman it would be white rather than red. But again, very, very beautiful, quite light because it's been carved out. They've taken enough wood for it to be quite easy to wear. And they would wrap a twisted cloth, probably a white cloth around the face and then hold it a little away from the face. So they can so they can dance. Now, this is very very unusual, and I've not seen another one of these in all the time that I've been coming to Nepal for well over 20 years, and uh, collecting and working with shaman, uh, buying ritual objects, travelling all over the place, and. This is uh, um, one of the, the big um, Tibetan Mastiffs. So it looks a bit like a lion and they actually call them lion dogs. But when you look at the mouth you can see it's, it's a Mastiff. And with their round low, low ears. And they train these up to defend the, the big herds of sheep and goats in the mountains from snow leopards and from um, uh, tigers. And so, and, and bears, and it, I was told when I was in, uh, up in, in Lumjung, in the, very high up in the mountains in Lumjung, that some people even further up still, still kept Tibetan Mastiffs, and apparently two Mastiffs can, can just about fight off uh, one leopard. Um, leopards are super fierce, and they get them to wear these big leather collars, so, because the way a leopard would attack a Mastiff is it would bite the throat. So the leopard is obviously designed as a, as a killing machine. And even, even though the mastiffs are, are enormous, they're, they're back they're like this, and they, they probably weigh 150 kilos, maybe more than that. They're, they're really big, very muscular. The leopard is such a, a mobile and aggressive predator that it will come for the, for the throat. So they wear these big leather leather collars to to stop them being um, stop them being killed like that. So they'll defend the herds and the the shepherds when they're in high altitudes. So again, this designed to be worn, but this time you, they look out through the through the mouth. So this is probably a tribal mask where they're playing out some some story which involves a, a massive. And this is a, a spotted deer, probably from the Terai as well, where you get a lot of spotted deer. And um, inside you can see, so it, this one doesn't have any eye holes, but it has the tie holes at the side and at the back. So this would be worn on top of the head like this. So the, they would wear a lot of wrapping around the face and a costume. And then, so it's possible that this is a shamanic mask because the deer have a lot of connections to the shaman. It also might be a tribal mask. Um, again, I, I need to get some other reference points on that. But what they're doing is they're taking the spirit of the animal and they're embodying it. And by embodying it, they also embody the the sensitivities and the awarenesses that the, in this case, the spotted deer has. So, 
if you can imagine taking on the qualities and you're drawing your inner inner aspects and projecting them into the mask so that you're you're able to bring your awareness more easily so this is a vehicle really for 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 transforming your awareness so that you're able to to better embody the the spirit of, a, of an animal or a god or a type of being that you that you need for a particular ritual or for or as a as an energy resource for your community so I'll just show you some other masks that I've got a couple of masks up in my house so this is a Kali um, it's very unusual because she's in a, a very unusual form but she's acting as a guardian and she she would probably be in front of the main main door of the house but with the arms spread out and this big grin so it's a very primitive form of Kali but I, I really love these sort of primitive pieces because they often have a lot of vitality and energy in them so I'll just take you through to the kitchen and you can see another mask hello so this is a, a big cat mask and it's designed as a protective spirit for the house so cats are often connected to magic and black cats even here are still connected to witchcraft but they're often a, like a, a seen as a guardian for the house as a protective spirit and I had a really strange experience um, a couple of years ago I, I went back to England because a friend was ill and I was there for longer than I expected and when I when I got back Kathmandu during the winter is very dusty because there's no rain and dust had somehow got into the house and it was it was like I'd been away for two or three years like the way you see on films and there were these cat footprints everywhere and outside every door just in front of every door was cat poo now very dried and I searched around everywhere to see if the cat was dead somewhere and somehow it had gotten into the house and then back out I think probably up the chimney I've got a big fireplace and it, it must have somehow got my roof and down there and then out again. So it had been in the house probably eating lizards and insects and things for a long time. And this has got that sort of fierce vitality with the staring eyes and the big teeth. It reminds me of a Picasso. There's a, a wonderful painting of a, a cat with a bird that uh, I used to have a, an image on my wall when I was a, a kid and uh, really just I love the vitality of it and the fierceness so when I when I came back here and I went to visit some of my shaman friends they said ah oh, that's so lucky while you're away the cat spirit was coming and guarding your house and the the pooing by every door was about the protecting like marking the territory and it was rather strange it was literally by every door in the house and on every level as well so it got into every room foot cap footprints on everything and drinking little water from the sinks and things like that so they, they said you know the cat was protecting you so I have this by my back door as one of the guardians for my house and then outside the front door also um, I'll show you with the Naga so although this isn't a mask it's serving the same purpose as the cat mask and it's here, it's a Naga god, so during Nag Panchami we do this ritual where you, you stick up these, uh, these pictures of Nagas, so snake gods, and I've drawn a, a snake goddess here with a long tail drawn in chalk up alongside my door, and uh, the Nagas are protective spirits, so sometimes you have Nagas carved in either side of the door or around the door of the temple. And so you stick these pictures up doing a ritual with uh, this, a mixture of cow dung. You clean everything off with cow dung and a special red mud. You wash everything off and then you, you give them uh, a big lump of cow dung at the top with kus grass and flowers and you give offerings of milk because the Nagas like milk. So this, is the, for, this was from around the end of July. Um, during Nag Panchami, and I've got it on the other front door as well. So here are some other protective spirits uh, of Naga 
around the front door. But you can see the door itself is carved with the, the magic eyes looking out and protecting the, the house and with uh, like lion dragons on the on the door handles and then um, symbols of uh, good luck and good fortune and being true to your own pathway. So the door itself is like a both a welcoming, a protection and a, a symbol for abundance. And then this is typical. So every house will, will do this, every shop will do it and uh, it's, it's, it's part of the way that the sort of ritual life is integrated and the masks are very much about that. It's about bringing out the internal qualities of spirit into everyday life. So I hope you found that interesting and useful. I'm making a big TV series about shamanism at the moment and another series on uh, all the ritual festivals of Nepal. Um, I'm several years into the project and it's an enormous project. So I decided I would, in the interim, make a number of videos about the use of ritual objects, um, the use of shamanic objects, and the symbolic life, the way in which those objects are vehicles for consciousness. So in the same way that we have um, physical tools for doing things, you also have tools for changing the way you experience reality and the way you mediate and project yourself into reality. So a mask very much is about that. It's very much about embodying the spirit of, of the elements depicted on the mask and becoming it and then living that out in the world in a way where, where it's directly transforming the, the experience of the shaman or the person um, embodying their cultural dynamics, their cultural stories. So I hope you found that interesting and please subscribe to the channel. Let me know if there are um, things you'd like me to make videos about and I'll see you at the next one. Thank you.